Well, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy day to join us on our call today. Meet the supplier chain pioneers. My name is Jeff, like, as I said, and I'll be your host. If anybody does need assistance, you can chat to me on the right-hand side of the screen for any technical issues. But during today's call, we have a very large panel, as you can see before you, and each of them want to address any questions that come in. So if I could have you look in the lower right-hand corner of the screen where it says Q&A, please type your questions there. Simply hit send to all panelists, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Now, we have a very large audience here today, and we're very grateful for that. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Kelly Keller, Vice President of Marketing Supply Chain Brain. Kelly, the call is yours. Thank you, Jess, and welcome, everybody, to Bricks Matter. I'm Kelly Keller. I'm Vice President, as Jess said, of Marketing for Supply Chain Brain, and it's my pleasure to be your host today. In the next hour, you'll hear from guest supply chain pioneers and their thoughts and reviews on Bricks Matter, the new book by co-authors Laura Ciceri and Charlie Chase, who are also participating in today's webinar. Our guest panelists who are going to share their reviews on Bricks Matter are Marty Kislick, Director, Global Operations and Business Development at FMC, Roddy Martin, Accenture, and former AMR Research Analyst, Roslyn Parson, Chief Operating Officer at Healthcare Purchasing Alliance, LLC, and Hugh Williams, Managing Director at Hewenden Consulting and former consultant of Ellie Goldratt. I'll be going through a series of questions for the panel, but we also want to hear from you. So please message your questions in the chat window, as Jeff suggested, where it says panelists. And you can address your question to any of our panelists, as well as to Brick, Bricks Matter authors Laura or Charlie, We'll compile your questions and ask them as we move through today's webinar. So we're going to jump right in here, and I'd like to start with a question for Marty Kislick. Marty, as a supply chain pioneer, did anything surprise you in the book? Well, um, what surprised one thing that surprises me was was to look at the history, um, to 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 see the history, the present, and the future um, in one place, in one book was fascinating. So it did stun me a little bit um, to see what I'd participated in. Uh, what surprised me was actually how slow, how long it has taken for us to move to where we are today. Um, and how much, me and the other thing is, how much meaning for the entire enterprise the supply chain has had. And it really just didn't dawn on me. It kind of hit me in the face when uh, when I read the book. Great. And um, Roslyn. Yeah, I agree with uh, Marty. I think the effect technology has on the supply chain has really made us realize that the scope of what supply chain executives still have to do to uh, help their organizations is at times very overwhelming. And Hugh, what's your thought on that? Well, um, going back to the first comment, um, how, how slow it's been? Well, I, I joined this in the, the early days of Goldrath, and I've got to tell you, I feel like the last 30 years have gone by in a flash. <laughs> so I'm not sure it feels too slow to me. But I think the thing that surprised me out of that whole thing was was the pace of change over the last couple of years um, a, a, a being brought about by the economic situation, just how fast it's suddenly gaining momentum. I do a lot of conferences around Europe, chairing conferences, and I think the thing that surprised me about the book was the way in which it brought together the whole of the end-to-end -end supply chain. When I see at these conferences, people actually struggling to get a cohesive agenda together. This book did it for me. Excellent. Roddy, what do you have to say? What's you know, I, th I think what, what I found surprising is how many good examples there are if you go out and look for them of, you know, small instances of where companies and, and leaders are driving very fundamental supply chain transformation. I can remember when Laura and I worked together and we would go out with the start of, you know, the research we did in demand-driven transformation, and big industrial companies would say, yeah, we don't have a shelf, you know, we're not a consumer company. Why would we, you know, uh, uh, compl complicate our operations by trying to go demand-driven? 
and today, even the big industrial companies are talking demand-driven. So I think the surprise was how many examples there are of leaders who have inspiring insights. And second of all, if you really go and look for good examples where companies have got value, they are out there. Mm -hmm. So, Roddy, let's continue with you on our next question. In the book, Laura and Charlie showcase how companies need to rethink how they predict demand to a more market-driven demand management process. In other words, the book takes the concept of demand-driven to a higher level that's now termed market-driven. And uh, I wanted to hear what your thoughts are on this philosophy shift. You know, I, um, I would almost say, uh, and uh, you know, some of the, the great philosophers, when we get to something that makes sense, we think back on how we used to think and say, you know, oh my gosh, why were we so behind? You know, to drive a supply chain from the point at which the product's actually purchased back into the supply system just makes absolute common sense. So the real challenge that organizations have is going from uh, what I call inside out, in other words, pushing product to the customer, in which case there are many things you can do, to actually sensing real market demand and true purchasing uh, uh, transactions and then driving the supply system. So it is fundamental. It's a new mental model. It's a new operating strategy, and I think that's why so many companies battle to make the switch to demand-driven because it means thinking very differently about the supply chain, but it's fundamental. And Marty, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I I haven't agree with I agree with Roddy. I uh, I say it, it forces supply chain people, the participants in supply chain, to be full business thinkers, to reach outside um, the business. It's a it's a whole enterprise participation, and that has not been a traditional role to be creators instead of supporters. Um, and at the same time, I think the market driven approach versus the demand driven approach um, gets us to think it facilitates thinking about multiple supply chains. You can't think about the whole the whole piece until you get outside of, of this business. And the other point, the second point, is about marketing and sales teams. Then in most organizations, they're the one set of eyes or the two set of eyes that go out and look. And they're not looking for the same thing. They're not enterprise thinking through supply chain. And I think when you when you have a supply chain look out, market driven, um, it gets executive leaders to look with a different set of eyes. It gets more people participating in that same place, and leads to more value creation from the supply chain. And Hugh, um, what are your thoughts on the, the philosophy shift? What do you see out there? I, I think I think what uh, Marty just said is absolutely right, and I think. You know, the concept is, is right. It's, it's an absolute must for businesses to recognize. <clears throat> but I think he makes a, a good point in that I think there's a lot of work to be done to get the sales teams to start thinking about, much wider about what their role is in all of this. Because uh, I think, as you said, there's a lot more need for, for sensing what's going out there. And I'm not entirely sure yet that the majority of businesses understand what that activity actually means and what it means for salespeople to do it. But it is an absolute must. Roslyn, on your perspective on the philosophy shift from, from where you stand in healthcare. I, I think it's a long overdue concept. Um, healthcare supply chain leaders usually focus on the differences between the uh, outside market and the healthcare market. <clears throat> they spend a lot of time and energy trying to validate their uniqueness instead of trying to learn from each other to improve the fundamental processes of what we're trying to accomplish. Because in reality, whether uh, your supply chain revolves around cereal or it revolves around medications, there are a lot of very common factors. So I, I think the book really described the concept, but for healthcare, it's going to be a culture change. Uh, Kelly, if I could just add one thought here, and that is, now, there are a number of companies that I've worked with who actually don't want to refer to their meetings as supply chain meetings because the comment is, and it sort of talks to a few points made, 
then only supply chain, traditional supply chain people come to the meeting. Finance and sales and marketing don't want to come to the meeting. So I think, you know, the thought that I want to plant in the audience is be careful how, to, how you refer to your demand-driven transformation because if you call it a supply chain project, you get very traditional behaviors and attendees mm -hmm. at meetings. So changing behavior would mean basically taking a look at how you present first and uh, bring people in. Maybe they don't know what they're going into, but it ends up being a lot more effective. Um, Rosalind, what do you think about the statement that we have evolving and not best practices? Well, <laughs> in the healthcare environment, for me, it pretty much means that, yes, we've evolved. We're doing some things smarter in supply chain. We're trying to automate some of the processes. But is that really best practice? Have we defined what excellence should be within our type of supply chain? Have we tied practice into uh, quality and cost structures? And I think that's where we're lacking. And again, I think the book allows us to think about things differently. Uh, healthcare struggles uh, with supply chain. Usually when you talk about best practices, you're talking about patient outcomes, but you're not tying the supply chain activities to that quality outcome. So for me, this is definitely a area of focus for our teams. And Hugh? I think they are evolving. I suppose it's natural in a way with the companies that we see that they're the ones who aren't the most advanced. So they're the ones who are trying to, to achieve something called best practice. But they've got a long way to go, most of them. Uh, you know, I like the, the evolution and the maturity that the book puts forward. And, and I wholly agree with it that, that a lot of the companies we see are still in level two, trying to get into level three. So they can only be evolving at the, at the moment into that. Um, certainly from their own performance, whether they actually understand what good practice and best practice actually is, some of them are too far back in the scale to even see that. So I think there's a long way to go with this evolution for sure. And Roddy? Yeah, I, I agree that um, it's very dangerous to call uh, what we think are best practices best practices. All organizations have learned are learning. Um, I've done about 55 maturity assessments of companies uh, in their end-to-end -end processes. Um, Procter & Gamble was the highest at 4.7, but the average was 2.9. So nobody has got up to a stage five of operating as an end, true end-to-end -end value network. So we have to be very careful at calling something a best practice and have you know, companies trying to emulate those as being the ultimate goal. I think companies are learning. I think uh, change leadership is really taking root. Those companies that uh, are up there in the leader, leader ranks, uh, one of the characteristics is leadership. Uh, and so, therefore, we will learn to lead and get to the ultimate best practices. But until we get to these ultimate stages of capabilities, our learnings are only evolving. And, Roddy, what are your thoughts on evolution versus best? Well, I, I think that, you know, the, the point that uh, somebody made about uh, stages of maturity, you know, whether you have five stages of maturity or three, it doesn't really matter, but companies evolve from reacting to problems to functional excellence to end-to-end -end process excellence. And so, therefore, the point is that you can only, you can't jump over phases. You, it's very difficult and I don't believe it's possible to suddenly go from a project-based improvement to an end-to-end -end process based. So you evolve through stages of maturity and you learn because in the process, people, process, and technology have to integratively align and improve their capabilities. So it's absolutely an evolution. This is, this is not you know, uh, take a big hammer and hit an organization. Many companies take five, six years before they really get down the road of, of this transformation. Marty, what do you have to say about this? It's, it's hard to, to add too much to, to my colleagues, um, but I'd like to reinforce a couple of things. Uh, yes, evolution, 
I think we must go through these stages. I don't think there's a way to skip them. Um, and I think the book um, really shines on that in going from history to the present to the future of looking at what it takes. I don't think you skip, as as it's already been said. The other one is, is what is best practices. Um, it's best for the moment. Um, so I think that um, we don't jump to some visionary and uh, position, and I'm not sure what the end point ever is going to be um, with this. We have evolved, not best practices, I think is true, and I think um, the idea that you may be on a leading edge in one element of your supply chain and not another strategically and decide to do that. So do we all have to move and be at the edge, or should we attempt to do that? And I think no. So, um, yes, it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, comment, and I do agree wholeheartedly with all the comments made. Okay, the next question would be for Hugh Williams. What chapter or piece spoke to you from the book? Well, I have to say to come through the book, as I said right at the beginning, um, you know, I've been working in this now for the best part of 30 years, so I guess I was there at the start, and I could, I really enjoyed relating to all the history, I think, as one of my colleagues said right at the beginning. I could see all that happening. But the piece that really jumped out for me was, I think, still the nub of the problem out there, which uh, it was just said a moment ago, is about leadership. I think there is still a major problem with the people who are at the very top of the tree understanding that supply chain is their business. It's not a department in their business. And I still think with all the companies we see, there is a major problem with that. I've not yet cracked it yet. I don't know how we get these guys to, to join it with it. But bringing out that for me, bringing out that piece about leadership and its importance, or shall I say it's important if it's not there, um, that was the bit that really resonated with me. Rosalind, how about you? What chapter piece spoke to you from the book? Uh, for me, it was Chapter 6. Um, being a clinician uh, in the supply chain world, I was so used to having algorithms. So, first of all, I love the section with the key concepts. It's an easy way for me to visualize something, and it gets the brain cells going. Uh, but the, this chapter did an excellent job at making us realize that, first of all, you've got to define what supply chain excellence means in your environment, because it's going to be different um, no matter where you work uh, and the, the various industries. It then also made me truly realize the importance of um, the human resources that we're going to need, the talent management. I agree with my peers on this call. I think, you know, we're doing a lot of things well. We're evolving. We're changing. But we are all at different levels of the maturity model, and we're, we're still struggling. So the chapter um, gave me a lot of good ideas, and it gave me a framework for which I can take back to my teams to try to help them evolve to the next step. Okay. And Marty, what, what chapter piece spoke to you from the book? Well, uh, of course, being the, the sort of more of the futurist and looking into the future, I think the last chapter, you know, relating to where it's going really talks to me because I think this when when companies do change their mental models and when shelf back or buyer back behaviors dominate the way companies design their business operating models i think we're going to see very different levels of responsiveness and and the ability to sense and manage risks and i think the quote that really talked to me was the quote in that last chapter relating to a consumer electronics company where uh, the, the person quoting said, you know, as I speak to my department and I realize that we're still managing on silo metrics and we're not thinking holistically about the supply chain. And I think that that's the biggest challenge that we all have is going from what I call a stage three, which is functional excellence, to stage four to five, which is process excellence. That's a, it's not a trivial uh, trans transition to make. And I, and I think, you know, if you're going to be successful in end-to-end -end process excellence, you have to think holistically. You can't have silo behaviors in an end-to-end -end system because you're just moving the problem around. 
And I think, you know, Rosalind in some ways is quite fortunate in that the healthcare and life sciences supply chains have so many years of, of uh, companies like the consumer goods and electronics industries learning about supply chain and evolving their end-to-end -end capabilities. Um, you know, I think it, it puts the healthcare and life sciences uh, industry in a good place to take those learnings, improve on them, uh, and get going. And so, you know, I think you're in a better place than the pioneers who were hammering this out from the beginning. Marty Kitzlick, let's hear from you about which chapter or piece spoke to you from the book. I'm with uh, I'm with Roslyn. Um, chapter six is just one. It's just great. Pulls it together. Great. It's a great ending chapter. Um, although I'm um, I'm always tempted to read it first. Um, it's where I like to start from. It, you need to start. You need to plan and create and plot out and be deliberate and have a lot of courage with that plan. And that's what Chapter 6 is. And it does pull the book together rather well. I actually almost, um, when I gave this book to my leadership team, I almost said, uh, read Chapter 6 first. And then I said, well, I don't need to be the editor. It, it works great at the end. It's just my, it just struck me so well. It felt good to me to sit there and, and have a very concise um, approach to plan it, write it, think it, and and really get your team and get everybody behind it and then start moving. Um, so I really like Chapter 6. Great to hear. And, and Marty, I'm going to ask you another question right away. This is a little more specific. Why do you feel that we have not reduced inventory? Well, and there goes the holistic comment, right? So as an analyst, we'd get calls and somebody would say, you know, I need to reduce my inventory by 10%. What IT system should I go and buy? And, and that's, that's a manifestation of the dependence, I think, that we've all built up around the use of IT and, and silo. So the reason we haven't produced inventory is we don't know what the root causes of the inventory problem are. What, in one case, uh, in one company, the reason why inventory hasn't come down, for example, in healthcare may be fundamentally different to why a consumer company hasn't. So it, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's two, two components. One is, not looking holistically at the end-to-end -end system and being able to do root cause problem solving as to what the real issue is. I think for as long as we don't have true market demand at the customer-facing side of the supply chain and reliable product supply at the uh, um, uh, upside of the supply chain, we are going to uh, have inventory problems. When we whether we run out of inventory or whether we have excess inventory, there's a mismatch of capabilities uh, in the system. And that's why we haven't been able to reduce, because we haven't looked holistically at the upstream and the downstream. They're fragmented. And Marty Kislik, uh, what are your feelings about that? Why do you feel we have not reduced inventory? Um, you know, I, I agree with Roddy, I, and absolutely a root cause being we just, we're not very good at it. But I, I come at it just from a different perspective. Um, I think actually uh, many companies have hit structural limits. In other words, we hit our frontier. The easy stuff uh, came quick. The sloppy stuff, you, you engage in improving your supply chain, and uh, some of the inventory items come pretty quick. And, and once you uh, once you hit that frontier, wow, um, you really banged into it. So I think people are banging into that frontier. Um, I think they're using inventory to address volatility of demand because we're not because just what what Roddy talked about. Um, until you get out there and really get into the market driven side of it, beyond demand driven, we don't have the tools and haven't built restructuring, haven't restructured, restructured. So it's going to take years until we're going to start seeing um, the frontier get moved by changing, by the holistic approach to changing our supply chains and looking at multiple supply chains and market-driven supply chains before we're going to start seeing that frontier move and inventories come down. It's still a balancing act. Inventory is a result in some aspects. It's also used as a tool. Right now, I think um, we're in a pretty primitive state. And you, 
What do you have to add about that? I, I completely agree with, with Roddy and Martin. I'd like to just take it a little bit further. <clears throat> Roddy talked about, you know, the reliance on IT uh, and, and, you know, not really understanding inventory from that point of view. Uh, and Marty mentioned the frontier. I think when you see companies who are looking at statements like a 10% reduction in inventory as, as a requirement from the board, I think that actually reflects the level of thinking of the people at the top of the tree. I think it tells us they don't understand the role of inventory, why it should be there, where it should be, what it should be protecting. Because to me, a lot of these demands for 10% or, or any such figure like that are pretty arbitrary. They don't even know how much they should have. So how do they know they can reduce it by 10%? So I think with Marty, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that has been taken. I think there are these frontiers there. I still there are think demands to, to reduce fit on a fairly arbitrary level. But I think it's a holistic view, as Roddy mentioned. I think it's changing the thinking, as Marty mentioned. And that's why we've got stuck. That's not happening yet. And Rosalind, I'd like to hear from you on this as well. In healthcare, I think there's an additional factor, and that is a lack of trust. A lack of trust of the data, a lack of trust of the manufacturer's ability to get the products to the organizations in time. And then they have the unknown entity. We can't predict when somebody will have a heart attack and their supply consumption goes up. So traditionally, what healthcare supply chain environments have to deal with is an excess of inventory just in case. Because unlike the uh, a grocery store where if you run out of a brand of uh, cereal, you can move on to the next, in the healthcare arena, if you don't have that pacemaker, it, it is a life and death situation. So even though the data may be there to some extent, there's always going to be that concern. They have not learned to manage inventory with PAR levels and other uh, means that industry has done and is so normal to them. So that's the challenge we have, uh, building that trust level. And then we do see that uh, when we can do it through some of our self-distribution models, let's say, uh, they give up. Then they realize, you know what, I don't need 10 of these $50,000 uh, items just sitting idle on the shelf. And then they begin to understand how we can reinvest that into the infrastructure of the organization. You know, you know just one, one point, and, and okay. this is not to, to oversimplify this, but I mean, we've all heard of 5 why problem solving. And I think if, if often when we get into a either a high or a low inventory situation, I think if you ask yourself and the organization why five times, you get to some very interesting answers. And I think sometimes those answers are a shock to the organization because they, they, they're not directly coupled to inventory. They impact inventory, but it's the way the organization operates. And I think that's why this holistic and our ability to root cause problem solve, uh, we jump at putting an IT piece in, often in a very functional way, and then we land up with another problem is that we can't see across functions, and so we end up by compartmentalizing the business with concrete walls around functions. Very interesting point. Uh, Rosalind, I wanted to ask you something just in general about the book. What did you learn? What in there? What did you read that uh, that was new to you that you learned from? Well, I, I think a lot of it validated either concepts or processes that, while I may not had have had the actual experience using them, uh, had heard about them. I think what the book really did was put it in such a organized, structured format that it made sense. So the areas where I may not have had the world experience, it was like, oh, now I get it. Okay, I see how this uh, intermingles. I really liked the market-driven um, sections, mainly because a lot of what we do in the hospital can be considered transactional. We know we have to align our supply chain with the clinical world, especially in the day of, you know, decreasing reimbursements and being paid on quality outcomes. Uh, 
And the book kind of made me realize that there is a way for me to meet with my manufacturers and get them to understand that they do have to invest in more evidence-based medicine because downstream, that's going to help the industry as a whole. And, of course, if we buy more widgets from them, which is the ultimate you know, goal that they want, then we're helping them to stay viable as well. So it, it was kind of like uh, different areas just struck a different chord with me. Okay, and Marty Kislick, what did you learn from the book? Well, I uh, <laughs> I kind of got a wake-up call about data. Um, I'm not a terribly analytical person, but uh, th- it, there's a picture painted by this book about data and information, um, and I mean that as much as I mean about IT. It, it taught me that um, we're, we're slow with it, where um, it, it lags, and it may always lag, but more about there's a lot of data out there. Are we really designing, you know, it pointed at me and said, am I really designing to use that data to create information that's useful in my supply chain and to create insights that I can make decisions with? Um, I feel like uh, I learned that we're doing a lot of fumbling around with data. We're pointing to IT systems which are hard to use and are lagging, but um, we can go a long way with what we have. And we haven't done that. Um, and maybe it's just for, it's just personal for me and my organization that, that we're going to have to design. I really learned that you got to sit there, you got to design it, you got to get it into the right people's hands in the right form instantaneously um, for them to and teach people how to do something with it. And I find that to be really, really tough. So I did learn, I did get a wake-up call about data. Okay, and Hugh, what about you? Yeah, like Marty, I think uh, the, the, the topic around data and the, the scale of the uh, the challenge ahead really resonated with me. But I think there was one more thing which, which perhaps even uh, did better than that. I think it was the discussion about the talent gap and the immediacy of that talent gap and I think that I always recognized that it was there and how people were struggling, but I think it's here, it's today, and I think that was the thing that came through to me. And the very fact that it's going to be here for the next few years, um, because the, the talent that we have is, is scarce, as, as the book points out. You know, the early guys are, are retiring out of this. The young ones are not yet through there, so the sort of fourth generation are not there yet. Um, and there really is a gap out there to uh, wherever you go, whether that's in Europe or the States, it seems to be a global problem. I really like the idea about companies really having to look inwards and resort to putting an education and training program in place. This in a world where we've been used to cutting those budgets as soon as life gets tough. So this is an interesting uh, aspect for me that the companies are going to have to re- re-look at this kind of area of investment if they're going to get through the next few years. That would really, really work for me. Yes, and I know Laura uh, at Supply Chain Insights actually did a webinar on talent management, so um, it's very clear that's an important piece as well. Um, Roddy Martin, what did you learn from the book? Yeah, you know, and and, uh, Laura and I spent a long time together in the trenches with companies um, you know, talking about and helping, trying to help them formulate their strategies for this transformation. The, the, the big learning for me, and it, and it sort of confirms what, what I've seen through the years, and that is the change management and change leadership is a very, very fundamental part of this journey. I love Tim Biedenhoff's quote from General Mills, where he talks about, you know, it involved a change in the operating model. You don't just change an operating model of a business by standing up in a you know town hall and saying, okay, we're going to work differently from tomorrow, because people don't know how to do that. And so if that change leadership and change management is not there, the organization is simply not going to internalize this fundamentally different way of thinking about how they work every day. So, so I think that's the big learning, and that you know, I would say to every company, don't think you can do this with IT, don't think you can do this with strategy. If you don't have change leaders out front, 
guiding, coaching the organization through this transformation. It just won't happen. Well, let's let's follow that line of thinking a little bit. Uh, I wanted to address this next question to Roslyn. Um, in Chapter 6, there is a view of the race for Supply Chain 2020, and how does it compare to what you see? How should people get started? Well, uh, as we just discussed, I think the first thing is you've got to have the talent. In healthcare, we struggle with this because, you know, our salaries are not like they are in the uh, business world. So we have to try to attract somebody who has that sense of purpose, who wants to help folks, and then pretty much capitalize on that and uh, get them to try to help us redesign the supply chain environment. Uh, in our world, we have to get clinical folks more involved in the uh, business of supply chain because there are so many decisions that traditionally in the past were done independently that we can no longer do. We can no longer look at that widget and just look at cost. We have to look at it and determine if the outcomes and if the um, uh, the re-emission rates are going to be affected. Is it data that we can measure and actually put into our hundreds of computer systems we have? So uh, talent management is huge for us. Another area uh, is how do we balance the investments in technology? Um, you know, we have that competing force of patient care needs and then the business intelligent needs. So it's a, um, it's a process that healthcare struggles with because our funds are so limited. And, of course, they're getting worse with the way uh, reimbursement becomes. But I would say talent management is the uh, first thing on our list. Okay, and Marty Kistlick, how about you? In the view of the um, race for supply chain 2020, how should yeah, we get started? Yeah, that, that race for supply chain 2020, chapter six, that was the one that uh, that really spoke to me. Um, how do you get started? And, and, and so, so I look at that and I say, well, this is what I do, and this is where I spend my time, and I enjoy that aspect of creating that plan and that vision and that and mapping that out. Um, so I happen to agree with the book, and I have happen to like the approach. Getting started, um, I get started with it by peer forums, by talking to colleagues, by looking and seeking for what companies do great, not in my industry, but looking at other elements of supply chain. Um, and I try to, you know, like most things, um, go about it rather deliberately. Go see what people do. Go open your eyes, bring a team of people together, go look in at um, at what you're doing today. Not necessarily what you don't like or what you don't see, but just write down factually what you do and, and what are the outcomes you're getting. Um, I'm very aligned to that kind of thinking about the race for, for Supply Chain 2020, um, but I think it's because it's holistic, because of the way the book will will let you see that um, you have to do this in a whole piece. So there's a lot of information gathering, and my suggestion for people who want to get started with it is um, talk to your peers, talk to other companies, recognize the similarities, see what they're doing, and uh, and get focused on building a plan. And if you can't, go back to the drawing board. Go back and look at the data. Go back and look at what you're doing today. Go back and look at your results, and then go look at the best of the best and people who are doing other things. It's not that hard to come up with a plan. Hugh, what do you see? What do you foresee how people should get started and how does it compare to what you read in the book? Well, I, I think the clues lie in the early part of the book. The early part of the book starts giving examples of people like P&G, how long ago they started, Unilever, Seagate, and, and all the guys who really understood and took on board from the top down that supply chain was their business. As I said before, it's not a department. This is something they took on board and said, this is something we're going to do. And I think that talent is, is, is one area, but I really believe that if people want to get started, they've got to get the whole company from the CEO down to understand this is not something they, this is not just a project. This is the way they should do business. 
And I think when you can get everybody on board with that, and I don't just mean phrases like, yeah, the senior management has bought into this or they're supporting it. They've got to be actively involved in this. I don't think buy-in and support are enough. I think they have to believe it. And, and as, as one of my colleagues said earlier on, unless you get that, I think it was Roddy, it's not going to get started in the same way. So for me, the, the race to 2020, you've got to get the leadership really involved in doing this and believing it's the way they've got to do business. And Roddy Martin. Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to play on the clever title of the book. I mean, Bricks Matter. You've you got to get the basics right. So, so I think that there's two fundamental basics. One is the point I already made around uh, a change lead. I mean, if you can't drive this, this level of transformation bottom up. It's got to be somebody that steps up in the organization and says, we're going to do this differently. And uh, in some cases, it's been as a result of a burning platform. But the second point is you have to get the basics like, for example, reliable supply right. Well, we talked about inventory. We talked about demand forecast accuracy. You can have massively accurate demand forecasts. You can have uh, you know, full knowledge of where all the inventory is. But if your supply system is unreliable and can't deliver to plan, there is not much you can do in the customer-facing process. And I think the points I want to make are – that hand in glove are change leadership to inspire the organization to move to this new mo mental model. And second of all, the basics in place, the bricks that matter, like reliable and profitable product supply, because without that, there's not much you can do in a supply chain. Understood. I, I wanted to jump to some of our audience questions here, and one of them that looks as if it takes a different aspect of BRICS, I think. Uh, from one of our audience members, it says, I have not had the opportunity to read the book yet, and I am listening to this call. I understand the supply chain aspects. I guess the title grabbed my attention, thinking of competitive advantages against online organizations such as Amazon. Would be interested in the panel's thoughts of competitive advantages out of imploring the book's strategies. So... Why don't we start with you? I'll jump at that one. I, I think that's an intriguing question. Okay. You know, it doesn't matter how online Amazon et al. are. There still has to be somebody who makes a product at the back end of Amazon. So no matter how we fulfill and how we take orders, reliable product supply is still really fundamental. So, so, the, so the argument is that even in an online digitization, big data kind of environment, Bricks matter, reliable product supply to, to, that allows you to get your product when you wanted it, how you wanted it, looking like you wanted to look, is still a fundamental requirement of the supply chain. That is the competitive advantage. Okay, let's hear from Hugh on that. Yeah, I agree. I think, Roddy, you make a very, very, very good point on that. I think it is the competitive advantage. I was uh, working with a company yesterday, and um, I think the, the supply chain director summed it up for me when he made a closing presentation to about 20 colleagues in the room after three days of, of workshop on this. And he said, supply chain is the thing we're going to we're, we're go at. The company's behind it. We're going to move with this. It's probably the biggest thing that is going to take our company forward for the next 20 years. Now, they were talking about people in the building sector all over the world where there's tough competition, there's all sorts of pricing wars, there's um, all sorts of tax problems when you're shipping products around. And his view was unless they did this, they wouldn't actually be able to compete. So there was an element of saying if we don't do this, we don't get to grips with this. We don't stand a chance of competing in the first place. But more than that, if we do it properly, we'll go way ahead of the competition in terms of, as Roddy said, the reliability of supply, speed to market, new product introduction, all of those things is what they're after, and that's what will keep them ahead of the game. So the fact that he stood there and declared amongst all of them and said, this is so fundamental to us, it's what's going to keep us going for the next 20 years ahead of the game, that, that summed it up to me. It's not just competition, it's about the wealth of a company and success. Rosalind, what are, what are your thoughts on this uh, coming from your sector? 
Well, I definitely think that uh, our world, while it may be slightly different, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I think we need to position ourselves where we can learn from those that have been there before us so that it, it can minimize some of the investments and the pain points that we'll have. I think we just need to understand that we have to change the culture. And it's not something that we can continue to put off. We're never going to be able to get to the next step. And uh, Marty? Yeah, I look at competitive advantage from from a whole enterprise standpoint, um, not from a supply chain standpoint. So when we pick on or when we look at an element of the business and talk about competitive advantage, um, I find that to be a rather narrow focus. Um, so, so if a company is looking at at their competitiveness as an enterprise, as a business, I can't separate supply chain. And and to let people attempt to do that would would be wrong. Now it's hard to get leadership to, to look at that. Many people look at supply chains and say delivery and service and and cost and and these. But but I I don't separate that and say what's your business mission? Who are you serving? Who is that customer? What value are you creating for that customer? And then the supply chain is your business, as many of my peers have just talked about. It is your business. It is no different than 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 pricing appropriately, um, positioning your product appropriately, having the right having innovation. But that whole that entire delivery of value. Is is integral, so I can't really separate and and make supply chain the competitive advantages created by a supply chain. Um, I can't break it apart, and I and I tend not to let people break it apart. Um, I do feel that that we're stuck in a paradigm um, in some organizations that the only competitive advantages they see in supply chains is um, make it make it available. Um, Speed of delivery, uh, quality, and cost, and I just don't see it that simplistic. So, Kelly, one thing I'd like to add, uh, you know, to to Rosalind's uh, scenario of healthcare and life sciences, and there's a you know there's a good story, and it doesn't matter who the company was of a pharmaceutical company had a great supply chain operation. They were almost a benchmark in the industry for sales and operations planning, and then they hit a huge regulatory compliance glitch. And the CEO literally shut the supply chain team down and said, what we do is we focus on delivering a reliable, compliant, safe product to the market before we worry about getting fancy in the supply chain. I think it illustrates the point of, you know, bricks do matter. I mean, if you can't deliver a safe product to market, if you can't deliver launch a product on time. It's all this basic stuff. That's where the competitive advantage starts. And so bricks matter, get the basics right. I think when you get the basics right, it allows you to do some surprising things at the front end of the business. Well said. wanted to reach out to our authors on this question as well. Laura or Charlie, do you have anything to add to the conversation in this point? I think what I learned in writing the book is that people for many years have said that they've reduced costs, they've reduced inventory, they've improved customer service, but actually we have not. And I think it's time for us to take stock and hold ourselves accountable to financial performance and to be not just supply chain leaders but business leaders. And as we think about that, the concept of the effective frontier that I learned from a pioneer of being able to balance growth, profitability, complexity, and cycles, and it's that balance of the system. And, you know, as I was listening to the pioneers talk about that in some of the interviews, it really brought home that aha moment for me of it is about that effective frontier and the balance. And I think right now, We've reached a plateau, and I think it requires a new form of leadership outside in thinking that Roddy's talking about, and also new technologies and embracing and driving insights from data. 
one of the things that I kind of laugh about is people talk about big data, but I really think it's about big insights, and I think it's about, you know, being able to really drive those outside in and horizontally. Charlie? No, I, I agree with uh, all the uh, comments that were made by the panelists today, and, and uh, I feel that uh, it is a holistic approach that needs to be taken and that we have hit a plateau and that it's going to require a lot of leadership uh, and not uh, from the ground up but from, or the bottom up, I should say, but more from the top down. Uh, I think that's the real important piece. And I think that it's going to require uh, a lot of change management uh, that will be driven by these uh, leaders within the supply chain. And one of the things that uh, really came out to me as we were writing the book and interviewing uh, all these supply chain executives is that there is still a huge gap of, on the commercial side of the business as far as being integrated in the, truly integrated in the supply chain process. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we continually talk about it as supply chain. In fact, uh, I noticed that whenever I talk to folks about sales and operations and planning, uh, when they define it, it's more of an operations planning and manufacturing meeting, and commercial and finance are nowhere to be found. And I think one of the things that came out clear to me in our conversations was the fact that this was a piece that was cited by several of the executives that uh, we interviewed that it was they were having a difficult time getting the commercial side of the business to participate in the supply chain process. So I think that's where uh, one of the frontiers is that we need to uh, overcome is to find a way get them to be more involved, and I think that's going to take leadership from the top down. Understood. We have time. I'm going to ask, I believe we probably have time for one more question to hear from the panelists about. I um, want to start with Roslyn. What one visionary prediction would you dare to make that you think could be a driving force in supply chains over the next five years? Well, I think the culture change for healthcare has to occur. Uh, our world is so different. It continues to evolve. The way we have to care for our patients, you know, is entirely different than 10 years ago. In the past, we made money by having patients come in. Now, it's all about wellness and prevention. So how do I get the key individuals within our organization to understand that supply chain, first of all, plays a huge part in this process and that we can't remain stagnant any longer? I mean, we owe it to our communities. Marty Kislik, a visionary prediction that you see as a driving force in supply chain over the next five years. Well, I think... I think what's going to, one of the things, and my prediction will be, um, is agility. I think that um, that is, will emerge incredibly important. I think regulations, volatility of, of markets and demand, um, innovation, crowded spaces, sustainability efforts, these are going to force organizations to look at their the agility of their business. And the agility of their business is built on the agility of their supply chain. Um, and I think that that will emerge um, that that will make people think differently about how they create, how many different supply chains they have, how. When I say agile, I'm not talking about um, a few kilos in their range of outcomes for the next uh, six months to a year. I'm talking about significant shifts in market market dynamics, which points right to market-driven um, information and mar outside-in thinking. And I think that that, that outside-in thinking is going to bring a real focus on agile supply chains. Roddy, let's hear from you on this. Yeah, I'm going to build on that last comment of agility. So, so let's. Um, I think the 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 big um, uh, insight that I'm going to give over the next five years, and that is, uh, let's not underestimate big data and the impact of digitization, because at the same time as we're building agility to change in the supply system, um, 
the, the analysis of unstructured and structured data out in the marketplace connects dots that we didn't even know were connected. And I think that as technology in leaps and bounds in the analytics space starts to make it possible to very easily analyze and find connections and patterns that we didn't even know existed, if you didn't have the agility to be able to respond, you're going to lose it. And so my, my, my expectation, my insight for the next five years is big data and digitization is going to have a huge impact on the way supply chains operate and the agility that we need to have to stay competitive. And lastly, Hugh, your prediction. I think we're going to get a whole lot of change in organization structure. I think we're going to see a crumbling over the next five years of the traditional departmental silos. And I think we're going to see a lot more things coming under the banner of supply chain. One other thing, just as an example, I think we're going to see procurement directors becoming subservient to supply chain directors. We don't see that today very much. And I think we're going to start to see a number of those coming under under the supply chain wing as being part of that in the end-to-end -end supply chain as businesses take this on board as their central driving theme. So it's organization structure for me that we're going to see. You know, just to add, I love that last comment about procurement. Uh, I can remember chief procurement officers saying, my future leaders in procurement will be able to sit in sales and operations planning meetings with salespeople and actually start procuring at the right place in the demand cycle. Because how can you procure uh, you know, off the cycle and expect a business to be competitive? So that's a very well-stated comment. I'm looking at our time, and I, I wanted to uh, begin to close here. Uh, Marty, what are your takeaways from the book? Just want to quickly jump in with like, probably maybe a few seconds for each person. Just one big takeaway from the book that you'd like to leave the audience with as they go into reading it themselves. Well, um, I may be repeating myself um, with a takeaway, but data insights. Um, data hit me over the head. It's long, hard, and difficult. Um, must be focused. I know Roddy's talking about, about big data and uh, data we haven't seen or unstructured, we don't know what to do with now. Um, decisions and insights from this data, uh, it, it's just, um, the book makes it uh, incredibly important to think about, especially as you start think, thinking about market-driven. And you look at the evolution, um, we're a lot about information, and I think, uh, yes, we need the bricks, uh, and part of the bricks you have to think about is information. Bricks matter. And if we start thinking about information as bricks, um, as, as the real hardcore stuff we have to do something with, um, I think we'll get a, get a different approach. It's woken me up quite a bit with data. Great. And, and uh, Roddy, uh, one sentence from you, one sentence from Hugh, one from Rosalind. I, I really want to hear from each of you, but we need to make it quick. We are running up to the end of the hour here. Yeah, I think uh, inspiring leadership that can make the business case for change. And second of all, a reliable supply system that's agile. And without those two components, don't even start this change. Okay, Hugh. Build on that. Education, training. Uh, the book says it all. If you don't get people trained in understanding this stuff, it won't happen. Completely agree with Roddy. Okay, and Roslyn. Uh, yeah, the book really made me realize that the supply chain has to change. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to have the sustainability we need in the industry. Well, I want to thank everybody who uh, helped present today, all the panelists, and I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. I want to remind you to be sure to order your copy of Bricks Matter today on Amazon.com. And we would love to hear from you as well uh, what you think about the book. So please give an Amazon rating and review once you're done. You can visit www.bricksmatter.com for all book and contact information. And you can join the Bricks Matter Book Club on LinkedIn. 
You will find thought-provoking discussion and current announcements about the book, such as Laura's book tour schedule, among other things, on the Book Club LinkedIn group. You just find uh, Bricks Matter Book Club on LinkedIn. And right now, we're headed over to Twitter using, using hashtag SCIWebinar. So continue the conversation with us on Twitter and let us know what questions or comments you may have for the authors, Laura Cesari and Charlie Chase. I know we did have some outstanding questions that we'd like to address. So please head over to Twitter with us. That's hashtag SCIWebinar. And once again, thank you all for your participation and attendance, and have a great day.